I get the question a lot. What do you do? Right. And my, I don't think my mom even knows what I do. I think she calls me a financial analyst still, but that, that's fine. Um, but, but really it's hard to unpack what is financial planning. And then when you get on the investment side, probably even more complicated. So we're going to try our best today. Uh, and, and to start with, I'm going to have Bob talk through, you know, you get this question, what does it mean to, to have a financial plan? And there's so many complexities to that and, and moving parts and every situation is so different. But what we tried to do to really clarify the process that we take as planners is, is our three-step guided wealth process, discover, guide, and engage. So Bob, you want to kind of share those, those steps and, and how we do that in practice? Sure, Brandon. And, and really, in my mind, as, as your financial advisors, and Brandon and I preach this, Stephen preaches it, we're all on board with it, probably the first and most important step that, that I view as my role is what we term discover. That is where we listen intently, we ask the, the proper questions to our clients to really help uncover their specific hopes and dreams in it, by asking the proper questions, uncovering their specific hopes and dreams, that really allows us to, to have the path forward to develop their specific wealth strategy. So step one, discover. It's listening intently and asking the appropriate questions to, to learn about the hopes and dreams of all the people that we're, we're dealing with. Step two, then we go to guide. That is where once we know where an individual is today, where they want to go to, what their hopes and dreams are. That's where we develop a specific wealth plan strategy, specific and unique to them. No two people are alike. No two people have the exact same goals and dreams. So those, those plans need to be specific to each individual. And that's, that's, that's part of the guide process is educating them on the specific plan, the recommendations we're making, and why we're making those recommendations. And the third and final step is engage. And this is really once, once we decide to partner together and move forward, our relationship is really just beginning. We're in the business of forming long-term relationships with our clients. We wanna be there as a, as a financial guide and a resource through that journey. And that journey hopefully is gonna be over, over decades. Watching kids grow up, watching retirement come to fruition, watching grandkids join the situation. Whatever it is, we need to be there as a guide and a resource to work with our clients through the ups and downs, through their life, make adjustments to their plan, and whatever, whatever needs to be done, we want to be there as a guide and a resource to continue to educate, inform. Part of that is doing webinars like this. So it, it's a process. We're in the relationship building business. And, and we're looking for, for people that really want to partner with us long term as well. Yeah, I, I think that that as 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 simple as we can make it, that that is what it looks like. So wherever you're at in your journey, right, we need to get a good understanding. That leads to good dialogue, clear next steps that we put in place, and then I don't care what plan we put in place. I promise, six months, a year, at some time down the road your plans are going to change or your life's going to throw us a curveball for good or bad. And we're going to have to course correct and, and make some changes from that. And, and that, that's what we are passionate about doing is having those kind of kneecap to kneecap conversations, sitting down with our clients uh, or virtually, uh, which we've gotten pretty good at, uh, you know, over, over the last uh, year. But, you know, once we put that plan in place, this is where a lot of our clients want to be hands off and, and, and they, there's a lot that they, they maybe don't want to know, or, or there's, there, there, there's some fear of how do we actually invest our money uh, to make sure that we can accomplish these goals. And boy, you talk about making the complex simple investments are very difficult to do that because there's so many moving parts, so many things happening. So what we're trying to do today is to give you an overview of our investment philosophy and how we do things, but then bring that down into some of the common questions we're getting in 2021 and, and, and how we're reacting to the new administration, the new market. So I'm going to start, uh, and then I'll turn it over to Bob more on the, on, on the now, but I'm going to start high level with our investment philosophy. Just as a, if you're an existing client, hopefully it's a reminder if you're you know, a new 
person kind of kicking the tires on, on what we do. This is a good overview of how we manage money and, and what we do. And it's really in three key categories. It's thinking long-term, it's expecting and, and embracing, because there's some opportunities from short-term declines, and not trying to time the market. And if we could simplify you know, investing in three steps, that's what we strive to do. Thinking long-term is very difficult. We are not wired as human beings to, to think not, not only for tomorrow, but you're talking with a financial plan 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, even beyond our own lifetime with, with more legacy planning for kids and grandkids. Uh, one of my favorite Warren Buffett quotes, and he's got a lot of good ones, but it's, it's, he says, someone is sitting in the shade today because someone planted a tree a long time ago. And this is a really, I mean, you look at how long it takes uh, the seed of a tree to grow, to, to, to really come to fruition and, and, and provide shade to someone who, who this person doesn't, it, this person probably not even alive, right, by the time it got there. And that's when you look at a legacy and a long-term financial plan and investment strategy, it starts to become those decades of planning and that mindset of thinking long-term. But this is not the world we live in. We live in a world, I, I tease my kids, right, they, they, they don't know what commercials are. They, they, it is everything is on demand at our fingertips, watch it when we want to watch it, um, get updates when we want them. And, and that can be dangerous for a financial plan. Uh, you know, you can look at your account every single day. You can watch CNBC and get 24 hour news coverage, breaking news, uh, you know, on the hour of what your, your investment portfolio might be doing and why that matters for something that you're not going to touch for 10 or 20 years from now. Uh, it's beyond me, but, but it's, it's, that's where people go. Um, so that that's that's the first step in the process is thinking long term when you start to, to to plan for decades at a time your your consistency in those plans you know tend to, to be a little bit easier to understand and, and predict um, but but the, the the second one expected embrace short-term declines is where a lot of people fail and, and where they want a plan and process behind what they do uh, I've shared this this chart uh, plenty of times it, it's I, I'm not big on charts and graphs and all that we got a few today but um, this is a great one because it looks at the last 40 years of the market, of the S&P 500, just a, a general gauge of the U.S. stock market. And what, what's interesting about it, not only, you know, the, the calendar year returns are, are quite different, right? This is a portfolio that has averaged a, a little over 11% a year over time over that 40-year period. But Three out of four years, you're, you're positive. One out of four years, you lose money. That's what those gray numbers are. You can see you know, 2008 stands out, right? That was a, a scary year, uh, the financial crisis. Uh, you had three consecutive years with the tech bubble and 9-11. And, and you can go back in the 80s, savings and loan crisis. You can go back to every decade has some crisis of the day. But what's more interesting to me is the red numbers. And those are the intra-year declines, meaning we hit a new high and we pulled off of that high. This is where investors fail. This is what drives them crazy. This is where they make mistakes because they get whipsawed back and forth trying to get in and out of the market. Um, but these are pretty normal. You can look at even good years. You go to a year like 2009, the market was up 23%. At one point in the year, it was down 28. Last year, great example. You know, Everybody remembers March. That was as scary as it's been for all of us in a long time. The market was down 34% in about a month, fastest, steepest decline we've ever had. And it ended the year positive at 16%. Um, and it goes to kind of our, our last, uh, don't try to time the market. You just cannot. If last year didn't teach us that, it didn't feel good to get back in the market or to stay in the market in May or June. But if you did that, you, you recouped all of the losses that you had in that short period of time in, in March. Uh, and, and, and that is just a, a snapshot. You can go over history and look these short term declines and short term could be a month. It could be three months. It could be a year or two, but in your long term plan, a short term decline or a correction in the market is okay. And if anything, it creates real opportunity because you can buy great companies at much better valuations than they were if you have that long term, um, uh, you know, mindset. So, so that's kind of the investment philosophy. Uh, you know, I, I don't know, Bobby, if you, if you want to share anything, but I'm going to turn yeah, it over. You know, just uh, yeah. one, one, one real quick thing, too. It, it seems like what I've learned in the past 29 years, and understandably so, people get emotional about their money. 
Absolutely, we understand that, and as what we like to refer to ourselves as financial stewards, having the the expertise and the discipline to protect the long term interests of our clients' finances. That being said, really, investing seems to be about the only example I can think of where, if something somebody wanted to buy all of a sudden was thirty percent off and on sale. They don't want to buy it. They want to sell it. And and really what we try to to do as part of the education process is help our clients realize last March, things are down over 30%. That's not necessarily a time to panic and and get scared. It's actually a time to get excited, whether it's reallocate some of the positions that you own, taking advantage of things that have, have sold off more than others. Um, if you have cash on hand, that's the time to, to buy and invest more, not sell and pull back. So that's a, a lot of when part three of our three-step guided wealth process, the engage part, that's a lot of the ongoing management and, and discipline and advice that we try to give those clients as well is where are you at today, your financial plan, your, your, your whole objective hasn't changed just because of of COVID and March was a down market. We're still looking at investing over your life expectancy, which may be 20, 30, 40 more years. So maintain that perspective. Use us as a guide and a resource. We're here to help. We're here to field your questions and your concerns. Yeah, no, great points. And, and, you know, I, I think to transition a little bit, I've been doing this for 20 years, Bob, you've been doing it a decade longer than me. Um, I think the more that, that you see, the more you start to, to realize that history repeats itself and we get the same types of questions. But today we're in 2021. We had uh, last year was craziness in all ways, not only with the pandemic, but we had a, a, a very divisive election. Um, I don't know that we're still have, have moved past that, right? But we have an election every four years uh, for the presidency, every two years for, you know, Congress and, and, and Senate. But but people seem to, if they don't get their way, seem to think, all right, now the world's going to end. So we, we grabbed kind of a consensus from just, uh, you know, anecdotally, the questions that we received from from clients. We did some surveys early in the year and, and later a part of last year um, just to get a feel for, for what's on your mind as our, our clients. And, and we kind of grabbed the top three that, that sort of play uh, probably in some way, shape or form, it, probably on your mind. So we wanted to talk through these a little bit. In future webinars, we're gonna dig into each of these in more detail. Uh, but Bob, do you wanna kind of give us on a high level, we'll provide some insights and perspectives uh, on, on these three main questions of, of 2021. Yeah, I, th- I think the, the first and, and foremost, and frankly, it, it doesn't matter whether you are a, a Democrat or a Republican, whether you voted for, for President Biden, whether you voted for Trump, it, it, it's irrelevant to us as your advisors and, and money managers. But s- some people are concerned. They, they see the amount of money, the amount of debt being added to the deficit. But really, one of the, the main areas that we, we see some of the changes coming under the Biden administration Certainly there's already been some discussion about proposed tax changes. Um, He has vowed thus far to not raise a single dollar of income taxes on families making under $400,000 a year. He is talking about increasing the capital gains tax rate, but that doesn't even come into effect for individuals earning less than a million dollars a year. So even the, the hearing the term raise in capital gains rates, their intention is to have that apply to less than 0.003% of the population. So for the vast majority of the people tuning in today, that's not really gonna apply to them either. And really the final is in the areas of corporate taxes. Um, In a race to the bottom globally, it seems like for corporate taxes, he's talking about increasing the corporate tax rate from 21 to 28%. My guess is on all of those, especially with more or less a, a divided Congress, a 50-50 split in the Senate. He is not a king, he's not a dictator, can't m- wave a magic wand, institute all these tax changes. So I think by the time it's said and done, we probably will see a slight increase in taxes here over the next couple of years. 
but I think it's going to be modest, and I don't see it as something that in any way, shape, or form is going to completely derail the economy, the stock market, jobs, anything else that, that might come down. Really, the yeah, can I, can yeah, go I ahead. Chime in? I'm going to chime in one thing. I, I, I promise to show you more charts because I know people love charts. So <laughs> uh, I'm going to attest to the fact that Brandon likes spreadsheets. I like charts and spreadsheets. I try not to share them as much with clients, but but internally, oh yeah, I, I, I like my charts and spreadsheets. But you know, th- this is kind of interesting, right? If you look at uh, Democratic um, presidents with a Democratic controlled White House and Congress, right? kind of where, where we're at right now with the, the tie break, um, you know, in, in, in the Senate. And look at the numbers, right? The, the, this is since 1950. Three out of four years, we have a positive return, uh, you know, in, in the stock market. You can see there were, there were some down years, which we expect. One out of four years, we're going to have a down year. The, the average rate of return of, over that right in line with where markets fall. Um, these numbers, by the way, if, if it was flipped uh, on a Republican, it, it, they, they're almost identical. They're almost identical. If you look at the average return, kind of the median return, they're, they're right in line. So it, it is not an administration that, that changes what happens in markets. And going back to Bob's points on higher corporate taxes, if you think that Amazon is is sitting, you know, with with you know they have the smartest, brightest people in the world. They're 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 the most well financed, um, you know, solid balance sheets companies in in the world. If you think that they are sitting and and panicked and worried about a corporate tax rate going from twenty one to twenty eight percent, you're just wrong. You're just wrong, right? They it, it, companies that are increasing productivity, that are are changing the way we do business, that are innovative they're going to do well in any kind of uh, environment, any kind of administration. And that's what we really want to focus on when we invest. Um, so I just wanted to kind of share that one as we talk through, and, and then I'll turn it back to you, Bob, on, on, on something that is real. Uh, th- these are things that, that, you know, you can't sugarcoat weakening dollar and, and higher inflation. Those, those, those things are going to happen. Well, it, listen, at the end of the day too, in, inflation is actually a good thing. Um, the Fed has already announced that they are more than willing to let the economy run a little hotter for a little while longer. So the fact that if we can get up to four, four and a half, maybe even five percent inflation, that's going to be a good thing. Um, the, the weak dollar that typically may go along with that, that's actually going to be a good thing for U.S. manufacturers and exports. Um, what, what I look at from kind of the, the big picture overview more importantly on what party is controlling the presidency and the House and the Senate, I take more of my cues from the Fed. And the Federal Reserve has already announced that they have no intentions whatsoever of raising interest rates or raising the federal funds rate till at least probably late 2022 into 2023. And if that really is going to be the case, there's not a lot of alternatives. And I, I, I think the economy is still poised for growth we are just now starting to get the economy reopened. We're going to start to see the U.S. reopening. We're going to start to see international economies reopening. I, I think there's going to be a, a, a nice big bounce to GDP, gross domestic product, both here and abroad. That's, that's going to fuel some higher stock market returns over the next couple of years. Yeah. And, and you know, one, one thing I'll add to that, too, is the all of these things, right, low interest rates, kind of the different levers that the Fed can pull, uh, higher inflation, these are all part of market cycles. And and there's always an opportunity to invest around these things. And that's part of what we do with having a plan and process behind our investment strategy is to look at where are there opportunities. Like Bob said, maybe more international, which there's a natural hedge against the dollar, um, you know, and, and some of these these. Uh, economies opening back up that, that weren't, um, you know, some good valuations in companies as the economy reopens up. So there always are pockets and places to invest in the current market cycle. One of my favorite videos, and I would love to, to, to get a webinar, you know, down the road. Um, it's a 30 minute video. If you want to Google, it's Ray Dalio. Uh, it's called How the Economic Machine Works. And he, he talk about making the, the, the complex simple. He's taking the entire economy and how it works and breaking it down into a half hour. So if you're one of those people who really want to dig in and kind of look at it, it, it it's, it's, it's encouraging because there are ways around all of these things if done correctly and, and having a plan and process behind it. So 
Um, you know, that's one. And, and then the other question I think that we get a lot is, all right, we had after uh, uh, we had a recession last year and a global pandemic and the market ended up higher than where it started after that decline. Um, you know, we've had some volatility. I, you know, March was a bad month, probably the first down month we've seen since a year ago in, in March. Uh, but we get that question is, is can this market keep going, right? You see the Dow now crossing 30,000 and, and hitting these levels, NASDAQ hitting all time highs. Um, Bob, you want to touch on that a little? I, I'll, I've got yeah, a and, and off go too. But yeah. Before I do that, too, just touching on your, your comment about the recession. Certainly, the U.S. and the global economy did go into a recession last year. There was just a report out today that the Labor Department here probably pretty shortly is going to be announcing the end of the recession. Well, really what we need to understand is they're usually about 15 months behind schedule. So depending on when they say it, it actually ended, my guess is, is that it, it ended middle of last year. We started to recover and we're now, we're now in a recovery phase. But as it, as it relates to the markets going up, the Federal Reserve, the government, the stimulus money, the liquidity that the Fed is pumping into the system, that is all designed to, to keep the economy strong and keep the economy moving forward. Interest rates, although they've crept up a little bit, are still, from a historical standpoint, very, very low. That is another positive for the stock market. Um, you take it even a step further, those long-term trends, when we look at technology, we look at the advancements in healthcare and biotechnology, the advancements in um, alternative um, in investments and AI, clean energy. The technology is completely revolutionizing the world that we live in. And I, I heard this, this comment several years ago. Somebody had, had said that the advancements that we're gonna see in technology over the next 10 years alone will dwarf what we've seen in the past hundred. So we, when, I, when I look at things like that and, and factor in that, you know, over any given 12 month period, the market is gonna be up on a, historically 75% of the time, three out of every four years, I can find enough reason to be bullish on, on the US economy, on global economies going forward. You know, one of, one of the other things that we try to do as it relates to, to managing money for our clients, think in terms of driving a car. When you're driving a car and you, you look in your rear view mirror, that's a really small mirror. The reason it's small is you're not supposed to be looking backwards to invest in the future. There's a reason your front windshield is so big and open. It's because you're supposed to look forward. And that's really what we try to do is look forward. We look for the opportunities. We look for the trends that we can try to take advantage of for our clients moving forward. There are opportunities everywhere if we if we look in the right spots yeah no question here here's our right, last chart i promise uh you, you got to get a couple of charts when we're talking about investments um uh, you know so so march uh, you know of 2021 was really may, maybe a little bit in september of last year the, the the last time we saw any real volatility in the market uh and the nasdaq had its fastest correction in a in a while um, you know, you go back in, in 15 days, we hit a, a, a correction. So again, these innovative companies, these companies like, you know, Peloton and Teladoc and, and we're not on Zoom today, but, you know, Zoom is, is like a verb now on, on it's something that you, you do, right? Um, it's like Google it. You Zoom know, is the new the, Google. Yeah. You know, you used to be Google it when you search. Now it's Zoom when you hop on a video conference. Um, but, but these are all companies that are really innovative, but then when interest rates creep up a little bit, or it looks like maybe the economy might slow, there was a big correction uh, you know, in that period of time. In about 15 days, you saw the market, NASDAQ go down about 15% um, in that period of time. You know, March statements didn't look as good, and we got to, hey, what's going on? Uh, but again, you look at history, and this, this isn't even long-term, right? When we have a correction in the NASDAQ, which are these innovative growth companies, uh, which we did, if you look at the next three months, the next six months, let's go out the next year, look at what the average, 90% of the time you have a positive return. This, this outlier was the, the tech bubble of the 2000s. That was a different story. The internet of, of, of the tech bubble in the 2000s is very different than it is now. These are real companies that are the new blue chip companies of the world, not you know, Amazon sold books in, in, in 2000, right? Now they sell everything. So very different companies. And look at those results when there is a pullback in these growth and these innovative 
uh, you know, tech forward companies, that's opportunity over the long term. And I would say 12 months isn't even the long term. When you look at, like Bob said, where we're at five years, 10 years from now, I go back to the Amazon story, right? They sold books 20 years ago. Where is Amazon as a company going to be 10 years from now? Where is the company that we don't even know of right now? You know, what are they going to innovate? You look at things on the healthcare side. So there's always opportunities. It's just looking long term and looking at, at where we can find those. Um, you know, real, real quick too, Brandon, you, you don't have to go back that long to realize and remember the day when there was a blockbuster video rental store in every corner. Good Netflix, uh, if you haven't watched, it's, I think it's on Netflix. Uh, it's the, the the story, the last Blockbuster. They're, they're, it follows a story about Blockbuster and kind of their story of how they they claim to fame. And but they didn't innovate. They didn't do. You know, that's that's what we're buying: innovation and disruption. And um, there are always opportunities in in those areas with volatility in the short term. That's that's pretty normal. Um, here's where, where we, I think we wanted to land. And Lauren, we're probably eating into a lot of your time. We'll wrap this up in two minutes and and and, and get to you in, in just a second. Um, this is what happens when you get two uh, long-term wealth advisors talking about investments, but hopefully this was helpful. It really, it comes down to you and your goals. Don't get advice from CNBC or, or a website or, or even worth the water cooler, you know, people who are day trading their 401ks. This is where having a plan and process is so important. We you have to have your investments need to be very specific to your goals of how you're going to use the money and, and you know, what you're trying to accomplish. Your time horizon of when you're going to use the money and then your tolerance for risk, uh, you know, in the short term, if you're, uh, you know, going to buy a house in three months, let's probably not, you know, be in an aggressive growth portfolio, you know, with that money. But if this is money that you're not going to use, maybe not retire for five or 10 years. And even then that retirement has to last 20 or 30 years. Let's have a different perspective on, on, our, on our tolerance for short term risk and our, our real time horizon on how we're going to use it. So, um, you know, that's the key. So we, we can talk all day about about the investments. We will have future webinars that dig into each of those details a little bit more. But before we ever get ahead of ourselves with a financial plan and and your investment portfolio, and, and this is what we really love and are passionate about, is just financial literacy and good financial stewardship. And that starts at any age. And Lauren's going to have some fun with this for whether it's for kids or grandkids, or I know there's plenty of 20, 30, 40, and 50 year olds who, who might need to learn some of these lessons early on uh, that they haven't quite done that. I was just as guilty of that, so there's no judgment, you know, cast. Um, I, I've made all the dumb mistakes that, that, that everybody else continues to make, and, and I've just learned from them. Um, so Lauren's going to, I'm going to turn it over to her, and she's going to, she's put some great material together and, and talk about financial literacy at, at any age. So, so take it away, Lauren. That was really, it was a good thing that my mic was off because I was like, yes, the whole time you guys were talking. It's funny how you can work in it day to day, but it is still so nice to hear just reminders that like, yeah, the changes that we had last year were difficult but change can also bring really incredible outcomes when it comes to the markets as well so thank you guys so much for that and um we got asked a question so i think this pertains more so to the um the merger that you guys were talking about but as the business grows will you be ending service to smaller investors and I, I know the answer to this, but I, I want you guys, I want to hear your guys' answer. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll take that as, as kind of leading the firm. And, and this is something that, that I've always felt is incredibly important. Um, and, and, you know, we are part of the Dave Ramsey Smart Buster program. Um, I, I don't care how much money you have. We just don't. And, and because we, we look at this as as generational wealth and this is money that is not ours anyway right we, we just want to be good stewards of that so now will we have different service models and we're you know things like that certainly but we we you know kind of have it our, our our if you look at our why it, it's to help families live their best financial life not to help wealthy families not to help people who have already made it it's to help families live their best financial life and wherever you're at we will have a, a, a clear plan of engagement, next steps. Um, and, and part of why we're trying to build our firm beyond what it is now is to have more resources where if we can help people who right now need some help with budgeting and debt payoff and that, then, then that's an area that, that we'll help them with. If they you know, are accumulating and, and you know, it's more you got to protect their family and, and grow the assets, there's a different service model and a different kind of engagement that we'll do for those clients. For clients that are business owners that are selling a business and have a lot more complicated 
moving parts, then we have a service and a, and a team and, and resources to help them. So to answer that question, we absolutely will help every client in every situation that they're in and just kind of meet them where they're at. Uh, I see that, that tax plan. Tax planning is on our, you know, I, I can show you my spreadsheet over the next 10 years of where we want to get. Tax planning is one that we, we get often. We, we don't have it now. We have some good partner clients that we work, our partner um, providers that we work with, but it's one that we, we have not done internally as of now. Uh, but it's something that we're absolutely looking into uh, ongoing. So and one, one, one other one other quick point too on on the whole tax planning and retirement. We work very very closely with our clients CPAs as well. A again, we want to form a, a team approach, a, a partnership, a, a real good working relationship. It's important to us that we we are part of the team working with their other advisors. We work hand in hand with their estate planning attorney. We may work hand in hand with their CPA. So it's a it's a collaborative team approach with all the advisors to make sure that we are all on the same page working towards one common goal. Awesome.